Hello and welcome to uh, episode 66 of the Notcast. Today is uh, Friday the 5th of March 2021, which means that this weekend is the uh, the first anniversary of the last gig that I went to before lockdown kicked off. And the last gig I went to, which was a year ago tomorrow, before lockdown, was in Haler and Ninth Wave at the Lexington in that there London. And um, it seems certainly pretty weird to think that in that time since then I would see one live gig uh, and the, the gig that I have seen since then was pop release itself at the Islington Assembly Hall uh, in December so I went nine months without a gig and uh, the way it's looking it might be nine months before I get to another one all the gigs which I got planned for April, March, uh, May have all been pushed back um, so much so that I've got one night where I've got three gigs uh, which I, I meant to go to and of course if you can't make the rescheduled date um, None of the bands say anything about getting a refund. So it's a good thing. I've got some friends. At least I think I've got some friends um, So today is uh, episode 66 and since I've talked about how um, it's been near enough a year since my uh, my my gig going social life ground to a halt today I'm going to be talking about my favorite live albums of all time uh, and the reason I'm going to be talking about my favourite live albums of all time is because they're not going to be like anybody else's list. So I'm going to give you an idea of some of the albums that you're not going to see on this. You're not going to get Stop Making Sense. Because good as it is, it's not a hugely formative album on me. I know the band are playing fantastically when I watch it and when I listen to it. But it's not its not my thing, you know. I love Talking Heads, but they didn't form me as a child. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take a chronological tour through my favourite uh, live albums of all time. And there's, an, there's another one which is going to get an honourable mention, which I'm not going to include, uh, primarily because it's it was never actually a live album. It was a VHS tape. And here it is, The Cure in Orange. Um, this was the, the, the release that brought me into the world of The Cure in about March... May 1988, um, when it was broadcast in a, in a short truncated 60 minute version on uh, BBC One, I think on a Friday night, uh, and they played pretty much the whole of it from Shake Dog Shake up to a forest, and then the last half, the last half of the, the set wasn't shown at all on television. Um, I'm just going to go and, and shut the door, by the way, because um, I have a cat in the room, the cat has now left the room, um, which obviously I'm sure you're you know, on bated breath to hear about. So you're not going to get some of the classic live albums that people will put in every bloody list of great live albums. You're not going to get Stop Making Sense. You're not going to get Prince's Sign of the Times concert. You're not going to get The Cure in Orange. Uh, I've never heard James Brown live at the Apollo. It could be amazing, but I saw James Brown in the year 2000. He was not great. Uh, but then again, he also was something like 142 years old. And since this... The Sweet Talking Guy bootleg, uh, which is based upon the Orange soundtrack, is a bootleg. It's not an official live album. I'm not going to be mentioning it today. If it was an official live album, you can bet your bottom dollar that the Cure in Orange would be in the list. Hang on, I'm just going to shut the door. Decided not to even bother shutting the door. As soon as I shut the door, uh, the littlest cat decided to start telling me off. And it's weird being told off by somebody that's seven months old and has claws. Um... I know it doesn't sound like he's telling me off, but when he goes, Rrr! I'm like, yeah, okay, mate, I get the hint. So, live albums. I'm going to go in a chronological order. Um, if the album has a video release as well, that counts. If it's just a video release, generally it doesn't. And I'm going to have to blur the lines a little bit with a couple of EPs that should have been live albums or weren't. So, the first live album in, in chronological terms, in terms of an impact that it had upon my life, is, is this uh, Logos by Tangerine Dream. Um, love this album. I probably talked about it in a previous episode. In fact, I definitely have. Um, but I absolutely love this album, and I love this album for, for three reasons. Um, the first one is when I got into Tangerine Dream, I was about 10 years old, and they did a lot of movie soundtracks. Uh, and I, I spent my life living in movie soundtracks because the world that was in movie soundtracks and the world that was in movies was more attractive to me than the reality I had as a 10 year old in Birmingham in the mid 80s. Um, so I was able to live in a world that had some kind of vague sense of of, of, uh, of sense, really. 
and, a, and narrative and structure and, and you know all that type of stuff so I listened to film soundtracks and since the only uh, films I could watch repeatedly were the ones that had been on television that I'd recorded on VHS um, a way to experience films that I wasn't able to record off television because a VHS tape could be up to £85 um, was to listen to the movie soundtrack and uh, Logos is, is a live album recorded at the London Dominion in 1982 um, and as is often the case with Tangerine Dream, their live albums were actually just excuses to release huge wadges of new new songs and new material. And um, the approach that they had for Logos was to take a, a number of soundtrack songs and pieces and blend them all together into into three new new tracks. So there was like Logos Part One, Logos Part Two, and an encore called Dominion. Um, and the soundtrack to the film The Keep. Um, is is present on this album um, in a, a re-recorded form um, as well as some other soundtrack material uh, and also um, one of the things that around the the format of, of live electronic music at the time was that people were recreating the albums live on stage so it wasn't a case of, of pressing a button the song running for six minutes and then pressing another button to, to queue up another song you know they were they were live mixing multiple um, tracks and streams live as they were happening in front of your very ears and eyes um, with a vague form and no no single performance or no two performances of the songs were the same um, and then they, they started to write new material improvise new stuff when they were playing live on stage and so for me this is a really exciting live album um, which is practically to all intents and purposes an album of new music now um, I could have chosen what is actually my favorite Tangerine Dream album which is Poland um, but Poland was almost all recorded in the studio uh, and the only kind of part of Poland that's actually live as I understand the announcer at the beginning and, and some crowd noises and about two minutes of actual sound. So I'm going to go through and not include Poland in there. I'm going to include Logos. Um, the next one, and, and this is, you know, it's, it's episode 66 and that's important um, because episode 66 will see um, what I regard to be one of the finest live albums of all time, um, Live After Death by Iron Maiden. This blew people's minds years ago. Um, certainly when I when I got into to music, one of the things that I thought was gonna be amazing was gonna be able to, to be in the same room as the people that recorded the songs that meant something to me. And then to be able to, to see them and hear them and experience it and to be surrounded by by people because when you're listening to a record in your bedroom and we've done a lot of that recently uh, it's difficult to, to necessarily think that there's anybody else out there that likes the same stuff that you like you know there's a sense of community in a live album that tells you that you're not alone in this world that other people have just as terrible music taste as you do um, I've got the vinyl edition of this downstairs I've forgotten to bring it upstairs because I am only human um, but Live After Death is, is an incredible Iron Maiden live album um, the band are flying at full pelt through this. Um, for the aficionado, there is a DVD release in the days when Iron Maiden would release a DVD. Uh, and I've chosen Live After Death because it was the first officially released Iron Maiden live album made in Japan. Doesn't really count. I should point out, episode 66, um, we have 666 for um, The Beast Over Hammersmith. That's a lot of Iron Maiden live albums. The BBC archives, which features Reading 1982, Donington, um, Made in England 1988, which was also released as a single CD and a VHS, uh, a real live dead one, uh, very possibly one of the worst live albums of all time, and I'll, I'll do a worst live albums of all time section at some point, live at Donington, again, pictures of monsters, Rock in Rio, oh there's another live album, it's been at least, oh god, six years since they last did one, two years after uh, two years after Rock in Rio, here comes Death on the Road. That's a terrible live album. Then there comes Flight 666. Then there's lots of other Iron Maiden live albums. These days Iron Maiden release a live album every time they write a new song. And they don't write many new songs, but they release a lot of live albums. So um, I'm going to be a bit scathing about that. But Live After Death is an incredible live album that I love to bits. Now the third one, and bearing in mind I'm travelling chronologically through time so yes all these records are old they will get less old over time is this bad boy uh, Jean-Michel Jarre's Rendezvous Houston and Leon uh, live concert um, which 
again, uh, I listen to a lot of electronic music. In fact, when I grew up, I think, or when I was younger, I think I wanted to grow up and be a synthesizer when I was older. Uh, this was a kind of like a, a medley of m many, many songs all played together in, in an almost um, you know, fluid complete arrangement um so it's a way of creating almost like a live recreation stroke remix of, of the best of his, his material loved it absolutely loved it still do this one will be a surprise queen at wembley stadium 1986 not live magic live magic is terrible uh, but queen at wembley um obviously the i think the last fully filmed queen concert um and this version is the uh four disc set with both the shows over the weekend and the audio of I think live at Wembley from the 12th of July this was on television many many years before it was released um, I recorded it off television because that was the only way I was going to get to experience music and I was like this man's brilliant now over time I've changed my opinion Queen perhaps not quite so brilliant uh, as I may have thought when I was 13 or 14 years old uh, but it's a great live album of a band at the absolute apex of its powers. Um, and, you know, at the absolute peak before they started to go downhill. Now, the next one uh, is, is, it doesn't really exist, actually. Um, it does, but it doesn't. So it was Pink Floyd Live in Venice in 1989, which has now been released on the later year's box set. Uh, and I, I just thought, this is really bloody good really enjoyed it and i think that concert really opened an awful lot of people's eyes and ears um to the world so that actually it's delicate sound of thunder by pink floyd the 1988 release not the the later 2019 re-release it's this version is the one that blew my mind as a child and got me into prog rock and therefore cost me an absolute fortune I blame it all on Mr. Lightbulbs here, but this is a, a great live album. It was, I think, the, only the second officially released uh, Pink Floyd live album at the time. The first Pink Floyd live album that had been released since, I think, the second part of Amagumma in 1969, which, by the way, had come out four years before I was born. So it's OK for me not to like Amagumma. Um, but this was just everything that I wanted. And it sounded live and real and recorded by humans that were awake. Um, there was a, a double CD version in what was quaintly called a fat box. Um, again, absolutely love this. This album opened a lot, a lot of doors for me. Uh, this is a Brazilian bootleg uh, unofficial dvd version of the laser disc um so that counts as well because i wore that vhs tape thin now the fourth one ministry in case you feel like showing up live 1990 uh, sadly um there's also a vhs edition of this which has a number of extra songs which is is far better than this but this album is the bollocks it is industrial speed metal played by people that are probably whacked out of their heads on drugs in a tiny room somewhere in probably Sacramento in 1990. And I, I, I listened to it and, and it's got you know great tracks on it like The Missing, Burning Inside, Thieves, Stigmata. It's everything that you want from a live album because it captures all the excitement uh, and all, all the wow of, of being there, really. Uh, but without, you know, having pints of, of lager thrown over you, uh, which was a drawback of, of seeing Ministry. Um, this one is, is perhaps a, a bit another surprise for you. Slayer's Decade of Aggression. Um, incredible album. Classic Slayer lineup completely at the peak of their creative powers sounds phenomenal and you could probably make a comedy record out of the in-between sections uh you know the song introductions that we've got it's maybe not quite as good as uh, paul stanley's people let me get something off my chest which i will link to which is an incredible album made of his stage raps but the, the in-between song slayer stage raps are fantastic um and a live decade of aggression it's just it's like being run over by a steamroller. It's it's just brilliant. And I think live albums are fantastic. So that's, I think, the fourth. Now, the fifth one, this one will be a surprise to some of you. Fields of the Nephilim, Earth Inferno, the live album recorded in 1990 and 1991, right at the end of, of, of the, the first live incarnation of the band with the original and classic lineup. Uh, touring the Elysium album. Elysium is an incredible album. It's even better when it's played live. This is a, a, a kind of like a double best of greatest hits 
Uh, and also with Elysium, there's a couple of songs that are on it which fade out because the band hadn't quite worked out how to end the songs. Well, maybe they have. But I always prefer live albums because they have proper endings, so the songs have proper conclusions to them. Um, and Earth Inferno, uh, and by the way, there's a, a DVD edition of Earth Inferno, which is now staggeringly expensive, which also includes, I think, uh, Forever and Remain, uh, the Revelations promo videos and Visionary Heads. And Visionary Heads is the the, um, the visual version of Earth Inferno. It's probably free on YouTube, by the way, which is, which is probably a much more affordable price than, than second-hand DVDs, but Earth Inferno is, is a great live album, and uh, Fields of the Nephilim, much like Mogwai and Pink Floyd, when I see them live, it, it's, uh, they're a band that I, I don't see so much as experience, and I kind of just kind of just stand there, and I just kind of explore in a space, and I just kind of think while the band play in front of me, and, and whilst it looks to the untrained eye that I'm sat there doing nothing, I'm, I'm deep exploring things whatever thoughts and ideas go in my head because it's not the type of music you can jump up and down to or mosh to necessarily uh, unless they play penetration um, but it, it, it's you know dense sonically and it allows me to explore uh, the inside of my own mind now you won't be expecting this one i think probably because it isn't actually a live album it's a live ep um knights of red godheads uh it's a five track double single uh, of live recordings from from 1991 and um, I think Knights Forever brilliant and I've seen them live many many times and they've always pleased me no end um, they make me feel like I've both activated god mode uh, in, in GTA and and they make me feel invincible so um, Godhead is a the b-sides of this are live recordings from a show in London in August 1991 and when I heard those live recordings um, I went from being fan of the ebb to being like insanely keen about them and i've never seen them play anything less than an amazing show uh, and this is on the ebb head tour as well in 1991 uh, which i saw uh, i think three shows of which was also you know a great period of of history um if we're going to get really strict about live albums we'll have to go for uh nights of live at, at hamburg market hall uh this is i think the uh a numbered um now yep this is a numbered one of 500 uh double album that's signed and this is one of a, i think one of 2000 dvds uh but anyway knights of ebb live are brilliant also by the way live in hamburg the dvd is available free for your viewing pleasure on youtube um now the next one is and isn't a live album um and this one will 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 i think surprise you is the live album version of it the the cd version of it Pesh Mode's Songs of Faith and Devotion Live is garbage. Um, it's just the 10 songs off the most recent album played live out of concert order. But that tour was my favourite Depeche Mode tour. And so therefore the DVD, Devotional, which is what the live album always should have been, a full representation of the live show, um, 18 live songs recorded in 1993, um, you know, the band at the height of their creativity and also at the height of their, their drug fueled madness and stadium eccentricity. This is a the soundtrack to this is, is one of the best live things that's ever, ever, ever been released and recorded uh, and gets very, very frequent and heavy rotation. There is a, a bootleg here of the Crystal Palace show, which is to all intents and purposes devotional live. Um, yes, I did say I wouldn't mention bootlegs, but in the absence of a proper actual release, I'm going with this. This is just devotional. is is, is a, an amazing live album. Now I think we're on seven, maybe eight. So we're also going to go 1993. Perhaps something which which some people may or may not expect. Metallica's live shit, Binge and Purge. This is three live shows from 1989. Uh, and 1992 and Mexico City in 1993. Live Metallica at this point were just incredible, fueled by uh, drugs, adrenaline, um, probably cocaine, white leather jackets, uh, just a fantastic stadium thrash metal band at the absolute apex of the best they ever were, hot off the heels of the Black Album, playing long, long shows. You know, I'm watching this and what you're seeing is a band that's really in the pocket. Um, is that they're they're you know riding high on a crest of adrenaline 
a successful, properly successful, stadium size successful for the first time in their life. And they know it and they know they're not going to waste it. It's like watching, you know, the musical equivalent of Pele at his absolute best is Metallica's live shit, Binge and Purge. Not only has it got three live shows on it, by the way, two on DVD and one on three CDs, um, it's, it's just the kind of thing that makes you just want to play air guitar and get RSI very, very quickly afterwards. This is the single of one that was released to, to back up live shit, Binge and Purge, and I think we're on about eight or nine. And all those live albums were albums that, which I've mentioned so far, are albums that really just entered my world and changed you know, who I was and how I saw the world. Now, this one, I think, may be the only one I'm going to mention, actually, that's on a lot of people's best live album lists. Nirvana, Unplugged, in New York, primarily because it doesn't sound like Nirvana. It it sounds like Kurt Cobain playing an acoustic guitar, which is absolutely what it did. And, you know, you, you, you're being able to strip away from the songs, you know, the, the sound and the roar and the fury to actually be able to experience the songs in their purest form. As they were probably written on an acoustic guitar. Uh, heavily bootlegged. I don't think it was intended to be released at the time it was recorded, but after Kurt Cobain's death, it became both uh, prophetic and, and somewhat somewhat immortal. Right, this one, not an album, but an album at the same time, if that makes sense. This is Orbital's Satan Live. Uh, it was released as three CD singles. The band wanted to release a double live album, and uh, they were told that they couldn't, so instead they released a double live 12-inch of Satan Live, uh, and, and three CD singles. So this is Orbital Live, 1996. Um, you know, playing all of the instruments, doing new arrangements, best ofs, and it just bangs. It just totally bangs. You know, I listened to it and I saw Orbital in 1997, which I think was a couple of months after this was recorded, uh, just after I'd finished seeing Kraftwerk. Um, they were great. Absolutely love them. It was brilliant music. And again, it's the same kind of thing that I've got with the films. The Nephilim, with Mogwai, is that it's music that allows me to, to just kind of forget everything and just be something else, be an entity or a, a brain and, and just kind of dancing and stuff. Satan Live is, is so, so, so underrated. Uh, and I think it's a great and essential live release. And by the way, Orbital Live, generally pretty damn brilliant. But not as brilliant as my next choice which is Underworld, um, everything, everything, recorded live in 1999 on the Buku Fish Tour. Here's the DVD edition of uh, Everything, Everything. Um, this is the, a live album that, that really, really captures what it was like to be there. Um, you know, when you, I, I saw them three times on this tour, uh, Manchester, London and Wolverhampton. Um, and I know that, that a couple of those shows were filmed because I can see me in the crowd. In fact, all of the shows. Uh, so um, I can see Manchester and Wolverhampton during the crowd sequences of Born Slippy here. Uh, and I can hear um, the Alexandra Palace show as well. Um, so I was at three of the shows that, that, that compiled the dozen or so that were on this release. It's a straight recording of Underworld as a live act. And Underworld as a live act, some people might think, oh, it's just a bunch of guys twiddling synthesizers and pressing buttons and stuff. And it isn't. You know, Underworld Live at that point were like some kind of um, techno, electronic, coke fueled. And by the way, I mean full fat coke. I don't mean anything, any other kind of coke. Coke fueled version of, of a, a hippie jam band. So like, you know, um, Grateful Dead or someone would do a 30 minute medley of about four songs all stuck together. Um, whilst a bunch of guys that were off their heads on drugs just kind of were in the room just going, whoa. Well, Underworld was the same thing, except it was um, bleeps and bloops and synthesizers and lasers, all the lasers, banging and lasers. Um, and this is, you know, the nearest thing to cap to being there that there's ever been. And those shows were incredible. And, and you know, the easily one of the best gigs of my life was seeing Underworld at V2000 in Stafford. Uh, you know, easily, easily one of the best. Uh, probably because only about a thousand people there and everyone else was watching Rich Dad's Cross first solo gig whilst he was being absolutely terrible. Uh, about 200 yards over there, me and about a thousand other people were jumping up and down crazy shouting lager 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 and res cowgirl and all that. This is just a great live album. Also, of course, free on YouTube. Thank you very much, YouTube. Uh, and not just because it means that you can just get to watch all of this stuff without having to... Uh, <laughs> 
to pay for the DVD. So there, there you are. Uh, Underworld, everything, everything. And a band that I saw a lot and still do. So the next one, year 2000, um, Nine Inch Nails and all that could have been. Uh, this is a double CD version, uh, which is also comes with a second album called Still. Um, and Nine Inch Nails are a studio band, uh, which was at the time uh, just Trent Reznor on his own. Uh, and then they played live. Obviously, they had to have a live drummer, a live guitarist, a live bass player. But when they played live, it was, I mean, certainly for many, many years, uh, Nine Inch Nails at Goldwyn's was the best gig of my life. Um, and this CD and this DVD are almost what it was like to see them in the 90s. Um, very good, very faithful very loud live recording um, and the best way I can describe Nine Inch Nails is kind of like you're watching somebody do some very very satisfying um, demolition work with a chainsaw uh, to your ex's car probably um, but I, I, yeah great live album better than the studio albums and uh, if you can get the double CD version with still on please do um, this version here of and all that could have been does have a guest appearance by Marilyn Manson, but it's a secret thing on the hidden menu, and uh, Marilyn and Trent are apparently not on speaking terms and haven't been since about a couple of weeks after this DVD was released. So I can I can live with that. It's uh, again probably expensive to find, uh, but also free on YouTube. So the next one, Craftwork, minimum maximum. I have praised Craftwork previously. At the moment, I seem to be mentioning them during every episode. Minimum Maximum is the uh, the live album that was recorded in 2004 on the, the Tour de France uh, World Tour. This is a special kind of laptop book set version of it. comes with this print here of the album. It comes with a, a book, which is effectively a, a tour programme. Hang on, let's take this out. So this is effectively a tour programme. Uh, it's a hardback book. Uh, with I think the, the international German keyboard configuration on there and then lots of photographs of the, the band and, and photographs from the live shows. Um, live Craftwork is where it was at at that point. Uh, live Craftwork these days is, is a far more sedate experience. So Live Craftwork now is kind of like watching a, an art museum. Live Craftwork then, um, as the band were still, and the audience by the way, were still you know fairly young um, and they... They played live with, with, I think, far more energy uh, and far more vibrancy. So there's a, a two CDs and there's a double DVD version of it. Both have identical audio. Uh, but uh, when we look in here, uh, this version will tell you that there's a couple of tracks that are recorded. There's the model, uh, which I think is at Brixton, and Neon Lights, which is recorded at the London Royal Festival Hall. Uh, I was at both of those shows. Um, yeah, It's incredible to think that I was at one of the or two of the shows, which went into being one of my favourite live albums of all time. It captures exactly what it was like for me to stand in the Royal Festival Hall and to watch Kraftwerk up close, playing live in front of my very, very eyes. It, it really does. And uh, it, it's a very faithful way of, of being able to, to experience that. Now, whilst I quickly remember, Minimum Maximum by Kraftwerk also comes in a German edition here. Uh... You can tell the difference by the track titles and the model is recorded at the Berlin Tempodrome um, as well. Uh, so that's that's model. Um, it's got some slightly different performances on. Unfortunately, the CD version of this is copy protected thanks to a dreadful idea that the world had in about 2005 where you could somehow put some weird crappy copy protection on to stop people uploading your CDs onto the Internet. Uh, very frustrating. And of course, nobody cares about that now because everything's all on YouTube. Um, so, Kraftwerk, minimum, maximum. I think, like a lot of these live albums, they either had a huge impact in forming who I am or, or reminding me of very, very brilliant gigs that I went to that I absolutely loved. Um, this is a, just one of the best live albums ever. It, this one should be up there instead of Stop Making Sense and Live at the Apollo and Sign of the Times. This is, this is the... The dog's bollocks. So, 
I've lost count of how many I'm at, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, next one, Flaming Lips, UFOs at the Zoo, recorded at Oklahoma City in 2006. This is a really, really weird release. It's a thing that's called a music video interactive DVD. So it's a DVD plus a whole bunch of MP3s and it's a live concert movie. There's a documentary that's in there. There's there's the live show as audio, which you can listen to and download as MP3s. There's just loads of stuff on it. Um, but at this point, Flaming Lips were probably the most direct and sincere that they, they were ever going to be. Uh, they were on the back of the At War With The Mystics album. I saw them a couple of times on the tour around this. Um, the great shows, absolutely wonderful, vibrant, lively, joyous occasions. Celebrations of being alive and optimism in the face of madness. Um, and, and it's all here. It's all on, on the DVD. So I love this album. Uh, and I think if I hadn't seen the band around about this time, I would have been fairly jealous of people that did. So, hey, like... Um, you know, Derek Smalls, I envy myself, which is weird, but there you are. Now, the next one, 2007, very, very topical, um, Daft Punk, Alive. Fucking great. No two ways about it. Uh, absolutely brilliant live album, brilliant live show. It's an album that, that created a whole genre, actually. You think about the way in which people do presentations of, of, of EDM at the moment, and, and you know, in the days when you have live shows and and people, all the presentations are, are frankly shameless rip-offs of what Daft Punk did with the live. And with the live, what they did is they created a, you know, almost like an eighty-minute, ninety-minute medley, mega mix of their best songs, all interwoven into each other, uh, with with peaks and troughs and and hits and and everything in there and it's absolutely thrilling and you can hear the whole crowd just being carried away in this incredible wave of euphoria and joy uh, i really wish i'd seen them then but um i was a snob and i didn't think i liked daft punk as much as i did um but i've seen it and, I, and this is just uh, just a brilliant brilliant live album and i really really wish i'd seen them on this tour but i didn't and um there you go um this is not a DVD. They didn't made the decision not to release a DVD of this, uh, but luckily a professionally shot, mixed and recorded version of the Chicago show has very recently appeared on YouTube, which is practically the real thing anyway. So we're coming up to the present day, hopefully a little bit better for everyone. Uh, honorary mention to Mogwai, um, primarily because um, I love this band and they, are, they were number one until about 20 minutes ago. Uh, this is a live release called Burning with uh, a DVD called Special Moves. Well, sorry, no, the DVD is called Burning and the Alive album is called Special Moves, recorded in New York in 2009. Mogwai Live are amazing, but I'm going to come back to them later on. Now, the next one, this is a very, very important uh, show for me. Um, Swade. Uh, the Royal Albert Hall. Uh, it was released in a number of formats. A clear vinyl version has been released recently. I still need to get round to buying that. Um, this is a two, two DVD, two CD uh, live album recorded at the band's main reunion show um, at the Royal Albert Hall in 2010. Uh, widely regarded by everyone that was there as, as their best live show. And, and the live show that really just kind of changed Suede and brought Suede back to life. They'd, they'd had a, an uncharitable end in 2003. Um, and this was the band Reborn Furious, reclaiming this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to come back and not suck and have a wonderful second act as they, as they, they entered adulthood. Uh, it was a great, great, great show. Um, I asked my partner um, during, uh, well, at the end of Metal Nikki, I asked my partner if she would marry me, and she said yes, uh, which is a section that's also the exact same time that the standing ovation occurs in this. Uh, I never thought that, actually, I, I, I didn't give the slightest thought to, is this going to be on a DVD or anything? I'm just like, I, this moment is exactly the right moment to do this thing, and we did this thing. And we're still doing that thing. And th there we are. 
and this is uh, a live album from that period um, it's a DVD two CDs three LPs the vinyl edition is downstairs um, it's one of the greatest live albums there is um, it's the best of Suede it's the Suede's best gig it's the I think their favorite gig and it's the gig that was so good that the band actually thought we can't stop we have to keep playing because that was amazing um, and and it was right nearly 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 at the end there's only a couple more to go now um, this one is a perhaps unexpected uh, the wonder stuff upstage the live anthology uh, this is a, a a real beastie um, seven CDs I think uh, one, two, I think I think it's seven CDs um, which covers every period and lineup of the band um, so for example shows from 1987 1988 1989 uh, 1991 including a couple I was at uh, 1994 uh, 2000 to 2006 I was at all of those 2009 to 2016 I was at all of those as well um, the Wonder Stuff have always been a great live band a far better live band than, than, than if you hadn't seen them you, you know you might think nah, but you see them live they're just fantastic um, and they've been fantastic they've always been fantastic I've seen them more times than I've seen any other band so I've seen the Wonder Stuff 168 times I've seen a couple of bad shows out of 168 but everyone has a couple of bad days when you have that many days you know, if by the time you got to the 168th Bond movie, if a couple of them weren't pretty rough, then you'd be pretty surprised. You know, there have only been, what, 25 James Bond films, and at least four of them are absolute dog shit. Sorry to swear. Um, whereas, you know, the one stuff I've seen 168 times, and I've seen maybe two or three unamazing gigs out of that. Uh, but they're consistently just great live. And, and this is... is a fantastic and very affordable live release. I think it's thirty pounds for seven CDs, um, and lots of their live shows are on YouTube as well. So I love this live album, and it's been a big. This band has been a big, big, big part of my life over the years. Right, I think we have four more to go, and eight minutes in which to do it. So two minutes per album. That sounds pretty fair, given that I'm talking about about twenty five albums. Idols, live at the Bataclan. Um, Idols are a great band. I know some people don't like them, but I do. And I, I love this band. And some people listen to them and go, they're all angry. And it isn't. It's energy. It's, it's power. It's inspiration. And it just happens to sound angry. Anger is an energy, and if you turn that constructively, anger is the thing that changes the world. So when somebody said, I'm not sitting at the back of the bus, that's because they're angry about how they were treated. Anger is not necessarily a bad thing. It can be healthy if it's controlled and directed in the right way to be a positive force for change. And that's exactly what the idols, uh, sorry, that's what idols are, is in my mind, a positive force for change to be able to, to highlight and to bring to the, the surface, I think things which sometimes get overlooked. Great live band, their shows are celebrations. Um, and uh, I, think one of my, I think one of my friends, Simon, is, is somewhere in the cover art for this. Um, right, three more to go. So we're gonna go to um, this band, which I've not really mentioned so far. I'm going for The Cure's Anniversary. Um, admittedly, this is a, a, a Blu-ray plus two live show on CD, four CD set. It's, I was at these two shows. They were great shows. These are very, very faithful recordings of them. The Cure are a very important band to me. Um, and these are, you know, the band at the peak of their live abilities. They've n never been bad live. Um, and two shows, one at the Royal Festival Hall, one at Hyde Park. The Hyde Park show was one of the best shows I've ever been to. Uh, not just because of The Cure, but because lots and lots of other bands uh, that I love played. So The Twilight Sad, Editors, Catherine Joseph, uh, Ride, Slow Dive, um, 
the tape. This will destroy you. Loads and loads of great bands played that day. And this is a film of The Cure headlining playing their 40th anniversary birthday celebration show at Hyde Park. Um, it's also a day where I met a great number of people who have become very, very good friends. Um, and I love them dearly. The, and also, you can get to experience the show without it being about 4,000 degrees because it was the hottest gig I've ever been at. Uh, the only reason that I wore the T-shirt that I wore was because it was the thinnest possible shirt that I could wear and not be arrested wearing. Um, I probably shouldn't have sold you that, but there you are. Um, this is two Cure Live shows, and the Cure Live are better than the Cure on record, and the Cure on record are pretty damn amazing, and the Cure Live are even better than that. So the next two releases, the last two, which I'm going to touch upon, um, you're going to be pretty surprised by, because neither of them have got a physical release, but I promise you they do exist. Uh, this is the first one. It's, it's Mogwai. 2018 live recorded on 2018 during the every country sun tour um i saw them four times on that tour uh they were brilliant live mogwai is where it's at and as i've said earlier um they're a band that allow me to explore the inside of my mind and to 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 just kind of meditate and think and drift off and, and just wander about inside my own head um they're brilliant thinking music uh, and when I see them live, it, it's concentrated, and I had a very profound experience. Uh, I saw them at the Royal Festival Hall in 2018, and I, I, I felt like I'd come out of that show um, different. I, I, you know, something wonderful happened. It was just one of those shows where, where everything just lines up perfectly. You know, the, the company was, was, was beautiful. The, the people were, there were great. The, the room was just totally locked into exactly you know what the band were all about it was just a great 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 gig you know sometimes when you see a band you just know they played a blinder and that was that or, or just a great great show and that was one of those shows um i felt that i'd, I'd uh you know really experienced something incredibly special that night um and the, the live album comes close to capturing that feeling and the other thing with mogwai is they change their set list very 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 frequently and so um you you've, you've got the element of not quite knowing what the next song is going to be uh, and they're always better live now the last one and you may have gathered this from the t-shirt which i'm wearing is again a download only release it is the twilight sad it won't be like this all the time live um i saw the band 18 times on on this tour for this album Every show was incredible and just mind-blowingly good. And the live album captures all of the feelings that I had when I was in the room watching them. And somehow those feelings have been immortalised forever in, in, in an oral form. Um, seeing the band's a very emotional experience for me. And uh, they're a band that I've come to love dearly. And the live album is everything that I wanted a live album to be because it takes me back exactly to those moments, to those rooms, to those people, to those feelings. And uh, in the days when you can't go to live shows, what you want to do is to be able to at least remember how it felt. Uh, and it's, it's one of the best live albums of all time. They also write great, great songs that speak to me very, very deeply and very profoundly. Um, and it's very rare that I go to a, a that I see them live and I don't have strong feelings and I don't feel you know I come out of the show and I feel you know ecstatic and at the same point relieved and happier uh, and I feel a lot lighter and when I see them I feel like I can let go of the weight of the world which sometimes I think sticks on my shoulders um, so that is the, the the last of the the, the best live albums um, that there is um, in short they're they're an incredible live band and this live album will, will get, you, get you closer to experiencing that. And whilst we can't be together, when we listen to the same music, we can be together. Um, I'm going to end here. The usual rules apply. Uh, don't be a dick in the comments. I'll post lots of YouTube links up of live recordings of various bands. Um, hopefully that, this has been okay, really. Um, and I've, I've really enjoyed talking through my favourite live albums of all time um, I will see you all again sometime in the next few days I'm sure no idea is what I'm going to talk about uh, it'll probably be boring unless you like old music or old men talking about your new music uh, but in the meantime uh, it's been 
Well, that's been really interesting, actually. I've never really thought about what my favourite live albums are, and I've had to think about that, and that, that means I'm going to be spending a lot of time listening to, to some of old live albums again. Uh, at some point, I'm going to go through the worst live albums of all time, um, and that will probably make me sound like a very, very grumpy old man, whereas I'm just an old dude sitting in front of a phone talking about stuff. Anyway, it's been lovely. I'll see you all again. Bye.